This is the second video in a three-part series where we try to build an air quality monitor using Rust, the Microbit, and a few parts we selected in the previous episode. Last time we found a driver for our sensor and were able to start collecting some CO2 measurements. The goal today is to display this information on the Microbit's LED matrix. So fire up your editor and let's get started. Let's start by taking a closer look at the hardware we'll be using. The Microbit has a total of 25 LEDs arranged in a 5x5 matrix. In this configuration, the LEDs in each row have their anodes wired together, and similarly, each column connects the cathodes. This means that in order to switch on a particular LED, you'll need to power up its row and then ground the appropriate column to complete the circuit. To display an image that spans multiple rows, you'll need to briefly illuminate each row in turn, cycling through them fast enough so that your eye can't see the transitions. For displays with lots of LEDs, this will usually be managed by dedicated driver hardware, but in our case, the rows and columns are directly connected to GPIO pins on the microcontroller. And in a previous video, we did briefly play around with controlling the full matrix. So what exactly do we want to display? The overall goal of the project is to turn the microbit into an air quality monitor. So I'd at least like to show the carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million and have some kind of a level indicator. The 5x5 matrix has plenty of pixels for some small fonts. So my thought is to periodically scroll the PPM value across the display. And when it's not doing that, show some kind of level just to get a sense of how high the concentration is. Okay, now that we know where we're going, let's figure out how to get there. The last time we played with a full LED matrix, we used a board support package to help us out, but we can't use that particular crate this time around because it had some blocking delays that are not gonna work in our async system. So let's see if we can find a more embassy friendly solution. Embassy based, that sounds promising. Okay, it's got a driver for the display, a copy of the embassy NRF HAL that we're already using, and it looks like it can scroll text. Perfect. The only issue here is that it's been a minute since its last release. However, the reason for this is that the crate authors have been busy cooking up a pretty big update. That includes support for Bluetooth, which we're actually gonna need in the next episode. So we're gonna do something a little different and pull this dependency directly from GitHub. Speaking of which, the code for our project is up on the RustyBits GitHub account. And today we'll be picking up where we left off in the last episode. The first order of business is to remove our copy of the HAL, which the board support package already includes. Then, we'll manually add the microbit BSP crate as a dependency. The version here will need to match whatever's listed in the cargo.toml file in the GitHub repo. And by the time you watch this, the version on crates.io may already be 0.4 or higher, in which case you could just cargo add this like any other dependency. But the silver lining of me living in the past is that we get to see how to bring in a dependency from a Git repository. Okay, the HAL's disappearance has made Rust Analyzer very sad, so let's quickly refactor this code to use the board support package. The microbit structure contains the same GPIO pin types as the HAL, but the fields are now named after the expansion connector pin numbers from the schematic. And we'll just need a quick change to how we import HAL items. Great, back on track. Our use of this crate is going to revolve around the display, which has the LED matrix type. But before we go further, let's start off on the right foot and create a new module for this code. 
and add a new embassy task to manage the display that takes ownership of that LED matrix type. This has generics for the output pin type and some constants that define the number of rows and columns. All right, let's pop the hood and learn a little bit about how this type works. It's got an array of output pins for the rows and one for the columns, a frame buffer to hold the desired state for each of the LEDs, and current row and brightness information. The example code showed us how to scroll text, but we're also going to need something to show the CO2 level, like display. This takes the frame we give it and then renders each row for 500 microseconds. So render is what actually updates the display, using the frame buffer to determine the LED state for each column within the active row. It ends by powering up that row and advancing its position for the next iteration. The scroll method will have a similar rendering loop, but in this case, it will need to periodically update the frame being displayed based on the text input that it was passed. Okay, so we'll need both the display and scroll methods. Before we can use these methods, we need a way to get CO2 measurements from the task that manages our sensor, and also a way to convert that value into text. In the past, we've used the embassy sync crate to synchronize data between tasks, and today will be no different. But we will be trying out a type we haven't used before, watch. Looking ahead, we'll need to share the most recent CO2 value with at least one other task. So starting with something that supports multiple consumers makes sense. So let's get this crate added. We'll place the watch in the sense module. Our tasks are all at the same priority level, so we can use thread mode raw mutex. U16 will be large enough for the PPM value and number of consumers. It'll be one for now, and we'll increase this as needed later. All right, let's start on the producer side with the sender. On each new CO2 measurement, we'll then send this value to all of the receivers. Next, we'll need a way for each task to get its own receiver. For the return type, we have two options. Receiver, which is more lightweight but has a bunch of generic parameters, or DIN receiver, the dynamic dispatch version that has fewer generics but higher overhead. For this project, either is going to be fine, so I'm going to go with the cleaner interface. This will also need to be an option since the number of receivers is limited. Great, let's get the consumer side taken care of next. We'll start by getting one of those receivers for our display task, and then start writing our event loop. Here we can use changed to wait for a new value, or just get the most recent one. I don't really want to tie the display's refresh behavior to whatever the sensor's periodic update rate is, so let's go with get. In order to scroll this value, we need to convert it into a string, or stir, but we don't have the standard library or an allocator. The first place I'll check for this kind of no-stood type is the heapless crate, which has all sorts of collections that use static instead of dynamic allocation. Their string type has a fixed capacity, and also a handy function to convert a U16. So let's bring that in. Now we can create a string with enough characters for U16 value, then try to get that initialized from the integer. And this can be given as a stir to the scroll method. I'm also going to add a little delay before the next iteration so that it's not constantly scrolling. The last step is to get this new task spawned in main passing in ownership of the display. Okay, time to test. 
Here we go. Nice. Interesting. It looks like it's starting with the first character instead of having that scroll into view, which I'd kind of prefer. So what I'm going to do is create a formatted string that makes the first character an empty space. We can move this declaration up, make it mute, use the normal constructor, then reset the string for the next iteration. Right. The core library's write formatting trait isn't in the prelude, so we'll need to import that as well. And we'll swallow that result. All right. How's that? Perfect. The last piece of the puzzle is figuring out how to show the CO2 level. The CO2 level will be displayed during a delay period after scrolling, and it'll provide a quick way to see if the CO2 concentration is low, too high, or just mid. One way to do this is to divide up the five rows into buckets of, say, 200 ppm. This would cover a range from 400 up to 1400 ppm, which is the unhealthy threshold used by the RNET. To make this work, we need to go back into our BSP and figure out how LED state gets encoded into a frame. This has two const generic parameters. X size is the number of columns, Y size is the number of rows, and the underlying type here is an array of bitmaps, one for each row. This is the type that encodes LED state for each column in a particular row by setting or clearing bits within a data byte array which is currently just one byte. So its eight bits can encode up to eight columns, but it'll be limited by the n bits field, which is set during initialization. For us, this will always be five. And the input value, if the row needs to be on, only the least significant five bits will need to be set. And if it's supposed to be off, this should be zero. And there's also an empty method that will give us that. So, with all that context, this should be pretty easy. We'll start by initializing an empty bitmap array with five columns and five rows. Next, we can iterate through the bitmap array using enumerate. But I'm actually gonna reverse the ordering here so that we start from the bottom row and work upwards. All the rows are initially off, so to switch one on, the CO2 PPM value will need to be greater than 400 plus 200 times the index. And to switch on all five LEDs, we'll set the least significant five bits. If the CO2 value is less than this threshold, then we can leave all the remaining LEDs off. Now we can call display by passing this in as a new frame. and render it for however long we want. Okay, let's light this candle. First we scroll, and then, yes. I gotta get some better ventilation in here. All right, folks, we're more than halfway done with this project, but our biggest challenge is coming up next time where we try to get Bluetooth working. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you then.